Okay. <clears throat> well, let's uh, go ahead, get comfortable, settle in. got your posture adjusted. Close your eyes and become fully present. So you've arranged to be here. You've got nothing else to do. Nothing else to worry about. What other, whatever problems you may have in your life, you're not going to be doing anything about them for the next, for at least the next hour or so. So just let them go. Let's just be here right now. In this beautiful, comfortable space with a lot of really, really wonderful people. Just become, become fully into the present, aware of sounds, of sensations in your body, of the various kinds of mental activity going on. <coughs> and just for the next little while, let attention move freely as it will, exploring this present moment. Put one restriction on attention. That has to do with thoughts. As you know, when you place your attention on a thought, you tend to quickly become absorbed into it. Now, if you have a thought about the present that your attention wants to go to, that's fine. Thinking about what you're doing now, or oh, maybe I should move my knee a little bit or something like that. Those kinds of thoughts are all right. But any thought that's going to take you out of the here and now to some other time and some other place, you know, uh, just don't allow attention to go there or if, as soon as you realize tension is going there, just bring it back to, to the sound or sensation or something that is present. So let's become fully present. So introduce a little intentionality into the movements of your attention. So intentionally explore this present. The sounds, the sensations, and also the kinds of mental activity that are taking place. Just don't get caught by a thought.
Notice in particular the more pleasurable aspects of just sitting here now. Pleasant feelings in your body. Sense of peacefulness. Happiness. Just being at ease. Use attention to explore the body for the more pleasurable sensations in it. Perhaps even the gentle sound of the traffic on a Saturday morning is pleasurable. just letting anything and everything be present in peripheral awareness. I want you to intentionally place your attention on the sensations in one of your hands, let's say your right hand, and explore the sensations in your right hand while letting everything else be present in awareness. And that includes thoughts, any kind of thought. Just anchor attention to those sensations by intentionally exploring them. Pay attention simultaneously to the sound of the air conditioning and the sensations in your right hand. What you might notice is that when you try to pay attention to two things at once, that your attention is actually moving back and forth, alternating between those two things. Of course, it depends on how long you've been meditating. If you haven't been doing a lot of meditation, it may seem like you can hold both of them at the same time. Try to notice that what's really happening is an alternation. <coughs> this is a third kind of 
spontaneous movement of attention that often occurs. That the tension often alternates between two or more things at the same time. We do this intentionally when we're multitasking. Or you just now did this intentionally with the air conditioning and the sensations in your hand. But it is a very significant part of spontaneous movements of attention. If earlier it seemed to you that you were paying attention to more than one thing at once, this is what was happening. Or if ever it seemed to you that that was happening, attention was alternating. So experiment with this. Hearing is fairly different from feeling. Maybe you could try paying attention to sensations in two different parts of your body at once. Or two different kinds of sound at once. Different combinations. I just want you to explore this and get as clear as you can on this experience of alternating attention. Now just go back to letting attention move where it will. And notice that this alternating attention is a part of what happens. And sometimes that there are two things that you seem to be attending to equally at the same time. At other times there may seem to be several things. One may be more prominent than the other. But it's not the only thing that stands out from the background of awareness. Okay, let's gradually take intentional control of movements of attention. Let's do that by confining movements of attention to sensations in the body. Let all of the sounds, smells, thoughts, feelings, and so forth be there in awareness. Just let them be there. But if attention starts to go to one of those, bring it back. Let it move to any sensation in the body.
do you see any pattern to the movements of the tension within the body? Perhaps a tendency to go to the strongest sensations, or the more pleasant or the more unpleasant sensations? Focus your attention on the back of your left index finger. Is this a place that attention had gone on its own? Can you recall, were you even particularly aware of the sensations in this finger? Explore them now, become very familiar with them. shift your attention to the sensations of the breath going in and out of your nostrils. Are you still aware of the sensations in the finger? Perhaps more so than you were earlier before you attended to the finger? Paying attention to something tends to make it more prominent in awareness subsequently. So while you don't have direct control over peripheral awareness, you can influence it through how you use attention. Attend to the sensations in your left big toe. You might not have been aware of them at all before I suggested this. And if you were, 
makes no difference. The point is intentional movements of attention. Attention can call up things into awareness that weren't there before. But where do these intentions come from? Well, of course, the intention to observe your left big toe came from me. But isn't there a certain similarity to the way all of your intentions arise? You're not conscious of them. They're not there. They don't exist. And then they appear. Aha, why don't I attend to the sound of the air conditioning? Why don't I attend to the sensations of the breath of the nose? But you can consciously formulate an intention. Pick five different spots in your body and then intentionally explore them one at a time. Choose all five in advance. There are two kinds of intention. There are those that are formed consciously, and those that just appear in consciousness, either from an outside source, like my suggestion, or from your own unconscious. So let's just go back to exploring the sensations in the body with attention. Whatever combination of spontaneous movements or intentional movements, the overriding intention is just to explore the sensations in the body and to not allow attention to go elsewhere to thoughts or emotions or external sounds.
you find any tension anywhere, just release it. Some part of your body starting to become uncomfortable. Adjust it if you need to. As I'm sure you will have noticed, the movements produced by breathing are among the more prominent sensations in your body when sitting quietly. So I would like you to confine, confine the movements of attention to breath-related sensations. Breath-related sensations anywhere in the body You can intentionally investigate them, or you can just allow attention to spontaneously move between them. Let the rest of the sensations in your body join sounds and thoughts and all these other things in peripheral awareness. Allow them to be there. Invite them to be there. They can find the movements of attention to breath-related sensations. Make sure that these other body sensations don't disappear from peripheral awareness. The same with sound. You know the difference between attention and awareness. Restrict attention to breath-related sensations, but without letting anything else disappear from awareness. You might notice how this sustained peripheral awareness gives you a strong sense of presence. Presence and even a kind of comfort, satisfaction. Notice how being aware of other things even makes it easier to confine the movements of attention to just the breath sensation.
So what I hope you're finding is that you are comfortable, relaxed, happy, and exerting this gentle control over movements of attention is not difficult or unpleasant at all. Amongst those breath-related sensations, have you noticed those that are caused by the air moving over the skin of the nostrils or upper gut? Maybe just inside the nasal passages. Explore those sensations. Make this the anchor for your attention while you continue to be aware of all of the other breath-related sensations, all of the other sensations in your body, all of the sounds, all of the thoughts and other mental activity that's going on. Just anchor the attention and open yourself up to this much larger experience. Perhaps you find this surprisingly easy and pleasant, almost too good. Your mind can continue its nattering in the background. Feelings can come and go, traffic, air conditioning, all kinds of different feelings in your body. And just by anchoring your attention to the sensations of the breath of the nose, you experience them all much more fully.
Now I'd like you to focus your attention more closely on the sensations of the breath at the nose. I'd like you to try to identify the sensations that mark the beginning of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. Just follow the breath with the intention of clearly noting the sensations that mark these two points in the breath cycle. Now see how clearly you can detect the point where the in-breath ends and likewise the point where the out-breath ends. Still being fully aware of when these in and out-breaths begin. Notice that there's a pause at the end of the in-breath before the out-breath begins and at the end of the out-breath before the in-breath begins. Putting your attention on those pauses might make it help, might make it easier to mark exactly when the in-breath and out-breath end. If you miss one of those on one breath, it'll just come back again on the next one. Try to notice these events as clearly as you can. And what has happened to your peripheral awareness while you've been focusing so intently on the breath. Get a 
get faded yet. Maybe you even completely forgot about the sounds for a little while. So just back off from this intensity of focus on the breath. And let the whole panorama of peripheral awareness reassert itself. Now play with this a little bit and see if you can find a point where you're focusing more closely on the breath. So to some degree you can mark the beginning and the end of the in and out breath and those pauses. But you're not focused so closely that you lose peripheral awareness of everything else. Try to find that sweet spot. a nice 45 minute set. And let's talk about it. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. says that when he wanted to check to know if he was 
still aware of these other things of peripheral awareness, that it uh, at least sometimes seemed like his attention was going to those things. Okay. Anybody else have that experience? And that's true. The attention responds very quickly and very directly to the intentions you have. And so, it, you know, am I still hearing sounds? Well, attention is going to, you know, it's, it's so eager to respond. It's like, oh yeah, I'll check, I'll see. Oh, yeah, I am. And that's the, those little flickering movements of attention. That's alternating attention. But let me ask you this. Although when you wanted to check in, attention alternated with it, uh, were you cognizant of having been aware of those sounds before you checked in and after attention had come back? Sometimes. Yeah, right. So. Sometimes you can maintain awareness while the attention goes back once you're yeah. satisfied. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, it's not it's not necessary. It, it's what's bound to happen is your attention is going to, to to help find out. It's going to jump in there to help find out. But it doesn't mask the fact that, as a matter of fact, you even may make it more obvious that in fact you were already aware of those other sensations even more before attention jumped over there to find, to find out about them. And the other thing that you'll find is really obvious is that when attention does that, even when it comes back, it, it stays more strongly in awareness. And so this is, this is, you have the intention to maintain peripheral awareness. And even though that Intention will cause attention to move. Intention, attention, but enunciate clearly. Even though your intention will cause attention to move, that's not a problem. You just are aware that it's happening. And you're aware that as a result of it happening, the quality of your peripheral awareness improves. So this is the, whatever attention does peripheral awareness one peripheral awareness's job is to satisfy the uh, the needs of attention so uh, an example I use is that uh, if you if you become interested in sports cars if you pay attention to sports cars after a while you become aware of sports cars everywhere and right or you know, you turn 14 or 15, and it's that way with members of the opposite sex. You all of a sudden, right? So where there's an interest in something, attention follows. And whatever attention does, awareness is going to make more of it, it's going to reinforce it. But what happens as a result of that is you, you come to a place where you're aware, and you know you're aware, and there's really no need for attention to go jumping in and trying to check up on it. Yeah. Okay. It seemed, although this did not stay for long, there was a, a an interval where it seemed like my awareness was performing as a containment, almost a cage, and the uh, attention would try and go spang, and the awareness would go, no, you were sitting here. And it, it almost was, a, my awareness was assisting my attention to, to, to it was like containing it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was, <laughs> I thought that was very different. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what's happening is that, uh, you know, Ordinarily, there's these different parts of your mind that are monitoring different things. And when something seems important, they project them into awareness with a flag attached that says, Hey, look at me, attention, over here. But uh, as you're 
uh, and that serves a very useful purpose. It's a very valuable thing, you know, thing to have going on. But when your attention, if your intention is to have your mind behave differently, it does start to respond to that. And the more time you spend exercising your mind in that particular way, then the more the different parts of your mind begin to respond to those consciously formed and consciously held intentions. And in, indeed, what is happening, it becomes easier over time. Because your mind is becoming more unified around a particular intention. It's never got to watch it before. It's, just, <laughs> it's, it's a little box. Well, that's a way of, I, I don't picture it as a little box, but that's certainly a valid way of picturing it. Well, it, it, we have different I, it ways hasn't of, been one before today either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so when we were doing the very much concentrated on the breath, um, yeah. I would describe that as heaven, like the pauses were, felt like they could just keep going. <laughs> um, and then when you said, oh, go, how much of your periphery is still there, and, you know, there's part of me like, oh crap, I don't want to go back there. <laughs> um, you know, because then I was aware of discomfort here and that, and then, so I just, it's like, okay, remember equanimity. So at that point, it was kind of that, I don't know whether to say the word balance, but feeling deep uh, discomfort uh, on an emotional level, but also still feeling that heaven at the same time. Um, so that was my experience. <laughs> and what was it like when you tried to find that balance point where you could keep your your, your attention following the breath without losing peripheral awareness? Was that that was yeah? There's some unpleasant sensations in the body, but so what? Right, that's the, yeah. the equanimity of, okay, right. that's yeah. just part of what is, yeah. and this is still here too, because... Yeah. I'll point out to you what happens, if you become overly focused, your attention becomes overly focused and you lose awareness, you become vulnerable, all of a sudden some strong thought will come up and it will capture your attention and you won't even realize it you've totally forgotten about the breath. Um, not only totally forgotten about the breath, but once that thought finished, it moved on to another thought, and another thought, and another thought, which is mind-wandering. So if you become overly focused so that you lose peripheral awareness, you're also going to lose that faculty that uh, Chris was describing as the box, which says, oh no, wait a minute, this isn't what we're doing. <laughs> right. uh, the other thing that happens when you become overly focused is um, there's a whole lot less stimulation to your mind. And so your mind starts relaxing, the energy level falls, and you can start getting dull and sleepy and things like that. So by finding, by finding an appropriate balance where you sustain peripheral awareness, you uh, it, it helps you greatly to avoid both of these problems of forgetting and mind wandering, of, of being captured so that it results in forgetting and mind wandering, and in uh, sinking in, into dullness. <coughs> Can you tell me the difference between deep concentration and overly, mm -hmm. what did you just say, overly focused? Mm -hmm. Yes. Deep Concentration is really all about attention, okay? And it's really all about stabilizing your attention, have what I call exclusive focus of attention, that's concentration. And it doesn't preclude continuing to be aware. And as a matter of fact, what you want, you want to continue to be aware. You want to be even more aware than you ordinarily are. As long as where you place your attention, it remains there, doesn't move around, has a steady scope, excludes everything else. That is the concentration aspect. 
Now, concentration by itself is extremely difficult to maintain. It usually proceeds into dullness. And what a lot of people, the mistake a lot of people make, is they get concentrated, they lose peripheral awareness, and they end up sitting in a state of dullness, and they'll have the kind of meditation experience. Dullness, by the way, is pleasant. You've probably noticed this, but dullness is pleasant. Uh, which is why we crave the kinds of activities and substances that make our mind go at all. Yeah. So, somebody who becomes overly concentrated, so they lose peripheral awareness, and actually in, enters into a state of sustained dullness, they'll describe their experience of, oh, that was wonderful, I was gone, I'm not aware of it now, I was... <laughs> and, and it sure was nice. So, yeah. And the other thing is sitting in a state of dullness, which in itself is, you know, it's pleasant. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, I suppose, but it's totally non-productive. Um, and it will take you, it, it won't take you anywhere in terms of the, the goals of meditation and, and the spiritual path. What we're after is to increase the power of consciousness and we want to get to a place where we have that incredible stability of attention. Our concentration is perfect. But at the same time, we have really, really powerful mindfulness so that we have even stronger peripheral awareness than before. And where it really becomes valuable is the extrospective part of it is gone. We are not peripherally aware of sensations in the body. As a matter of fact, we have no awareness of body sensations at all. We're not aware of sounds. As a matter of fact, somebody's got to go and you know set up a firecracker beside our ear before we're going to notice sounds. Kind of thing. But we're going to be extremely aware of the mind itself and everything that's going on in the mind, of the state of the mind and the activities of the mind and all the subtlety. It's that introspective awareness. This is, if, if you've heard of the jhanas, uh, dhyanas is the uh, Sanskrit equivalent for jhana, the absorptions, meditative absorptions. You, the absorptions are where you enter in, into this mental groove of purposely, per perfectly focused attention accompanied by, by very powerful introspective awareness. In the, in the description of the jhanas, that's called uh, sati sampajana, or mindfulness with clear comprehension, which is what makes the jhanas such a powerful practice. But even without it, these jhanas are sort of a specialized mental state, very powerful and very useful. But really where we're going is a place where we can concentrate our attention in that way to whatever degree serves our purpose while simultaneously having this powerful mindfulness, which is, it becomes most useful when it becomes predominantly introspective. Okay. So over-concentration would be where you're robbing, you're robbing peripheral awareness <coughs> for the sake of highly focused attention. And, it, and if you slip into dullness, it becomes really easy to, to sustain that. You say, wow, I have this sustained single-pointed attention, I haven't had a single thought, I'm not aware of anything else, and oh boy, does it feel good. But it's, it's not really what we're after. <laughs> yes? So when you miss, when you feel yourself going, is there, is there some graceful way to pull it back or do you just have to go, oh no, that wasn't it. <laughs> when, I missed. When, when you miss what? When when it, uh, I, I certainly find it very easy to fall into dullness. It's, oh, yeah. it's something that I've been, you know, messing with figure oh, yeah. ground for years now, still haven't got it quite the way I want it. Everybody yeah. has a problem with dullness. I mean, when you meditate, you're, you're, you're moving so much of the normal stimulus of the mind that keeps it awake and alert. You know, and uh, it's like the people that you hire to work for when they don't have a lot to do, they conserve energy, right? So there's the, the old way, the, the beginner way that I had been suddenly discovering I'm dull and going, meh, and, and trying to 
push the walls back out again. It sounded just a moment ago like you were suggesting huh. there's this this great more graceful way to hover back let out me, of it. Let me just give you the larger picture. Okay. You 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 come to a place in in, in stage four you work on gross dullness, so it gets you into the drowsiness and sleepiness and to dream like things. Yeah, I'm really good at that. Yeah. And <laughs> stage four, there are methods, there are ways to overcome that. And then stage five, you overcome the subtle dullness. And instead, when you sit down to meditate, instead of your mind gradually becoming less and less alert and the energy level falling, it's just it's just the opposite. You sit down to meditate, and as you meditate, you become more powerfully conscious and more fully alert. This is the where we're going. Now, how you overcome dullness is by recognizing it and counteracting it. You're training your mind, okay? Your mind has a, a whole lifetime of conditioning. You know, when nothing much is going on, I get dull, right? Like those workers talk about, you don't have a job to do, but, you know, having that behind the shed, right? That's what your mind does. It's natural, it's good, it's, it's beneficial, you know. Conserve energy and all of that. But we don't want that to happen in, uh, in meditation. So we train the mind that that's fine to do at other times, but when we're meditating, we don't do that. In fact, we go the other way. How do you train the mind? Same way you do puppy dogs. As soon as it starts to do the wrong thing, you correct it. And of course, to for your training to be effective, you know, and for it to for it to occur with maximal speed and efficiency, you know, you try to catch the puppy dog every time. Because every time he gets away with it and you let it slide, it's going to take that much more training, right? And you try to catch the puppy dog sooner and sooner. Your mind is like training a puppy dog. It's all a matter of recognizing when dullness is there and correcting for it. And if you do that consistently, recognize it and correct for it, your mind will learn, it will become really obedient, and you'll come to a place where dullness is no longer a problem uh, at all, except perhaps when you didn't get much sleep the night before and you're trying to meditate or you know, you're sick or something like that, though then, you know, it, it's going to be there. But you reach a point where dullness is just not a factor in meditation. And what happens is you've trained your mind not to do that. So the correction is done with attention or intention? It's, it's done through intention, and part of what you use is attention, but there's also some more gross physical things that you do, too. Now, there's a way to do this properly, and it's important to make the distinction between... Uh, Strong dullness and uh, subtle dullness. And I said, you overcome the strong dullness in stage four while deliberately leaving the subtle dullness alone. Because the subtle dullness, you see, and we were talking earlier about over-concentration. The more concentrated you become, then uh, you tend to get a little bit dull. And the more dull you become, the easier it is to stay on one object, at least until something comes along and hijacks you. So a sustained state of subtle dullness makes it easier, uh, it, it, allows it, it allows you to deal with distractions more effectively. If you arouse the mind too much, you just get agitated and there's more distractions, and the more distractions there are, the more likely one of them is going to catch you. So the trick here is to deal with the strong dullness first and tolerate the subtle dullness in stage four. And then in stage five, stage five is all about, okay, I don't have strong dullness anymore. And not only that, uh, the other part of stage four is overcoming gross distractions, which I haven't explained yet, but I plan to lead you through. And I'll talk about distractions when I come back in lunch. But anyway. I just want to put, um, is dullness kind of on, or I guess you're saying it's not, kind of on the edge of sleeping? Going to well, sleep? strong dullness is the edge of sleeping. Okay. Yeah. And uh, subtle dullness is something different. It's just things are not 
quite so sharp and clear, and you're not as alert, and you can have sustained subtle dullness. Um, <laughs> you can have a, a sustained state of subtle dullness that doesn't progress to strong dullness. And that's all right in stage four. But you, in stage five, you want to get over that. But in both cases, overcoming both kinds of dullness, it's the, the process is exactly the same. Recognizing it, and the sooner you recognize it, and more consistently you recognize it, then uh, you can correct for it right away. The form the correction takes, if you're having strong dullness, you might have to do something that is very significant physically. You know, if you find yourself falling asleep and then you wake yourself up and then no time at all you're falling asleep again, you might have to stand up. You might have to meditate standing up for a few minutes, which gets very uncomfortable and you get very wide awake and then you can sit down again. But there's simpler things you can do. You can tense and relax your muscles. You know, if you hold your muscles and just clench them really tight until you start to tremble a little bit and then let go of them, you're going to feel that surge of energy. Do that two or three times and you're probably not going to be dull anymore. Or you can take deep breaths. So uh, when dullness is strong, you need strong antidotes. And you know you have a strong enough, you've used a strong enough antidote if the dullness doesn't come back for three to five minutes. If it comes back sooner than that, you needed a stronger antidote. If it doesn't come back for five minutes, it means that you pulled yourself completely out of the dullness, but then the same process that caused it, you know, it's like you, you correct the puppy dog this morning, well, this afternoon you're probably going to do the same thing. Pull yourself out of dullness, you correct for that, and if you complete, correct it for it completely, you're going to have a window of three to five minutes before the dullness returns. But you want to be on guard for it. Catch it and correct for it. Now, as dullness becomes more in its more mild forms, it requires milder antidotes. Sometimes, just as mild as refocusing your attention on the breath uh, it, it is enough to bring you out of the dullness. Or meditating with your eyes open for a little while is enough to bring you out of the dullness. You know, the, 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 the degree of dullness dictates the strength of the antidote. But don't hesitate to use what's necessary. If There's what's called sinking. Okay? If, if you've been in dullness, if you've pulled yourself out of it, and if very quickly, you know, less than, less than three minutes, you find yourself sinking back into dullness, that's the state called sinking. Okay? So, if you find yourself sinking and you use the strongest antidotes you can, you might, you might have to do walking meditation instead of sitting. You might have to go to the bathroom and splash cold water in your face. Or in an extreme case, you might have to say, okay, enough's enough, I'm going to have a nap, and a half an hour from now I'm going to do my meditation. You know? So you do whatever is necessary. What you don't do is allow yourself to sit in dullness. Well, here again comes the distinction. When you're in stage four, you'll allow yourself to sit in a mild state of sustained subtle dullness because it's actually useful at that state. You know, but you would, but you do not allow yourself to sit there. You know, when you sit there and use the eyelids are heavy and your head starts to go down. Oh, okay, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> you know, that, that's not good. That's not good. You've got to pull yourself out of it completely. And if whatever you just did wasn't enough, do something else. And then, now that you're awake and alert again, be on guard, because a very good chance it's going to come back again. You know, and you've got to be consistent. And a little digression in, into dullness. And <laughs> it is time for our lunch break, but I'll, I, I can always afford to extend lunch five minutes. If, if there's any any questions or anything somebody wants to say about what we actually did in this last period of time. Yes? Just, just uh, you talked kind of about how we can only put our attention on a single thing or uh, our awareness and I find that, like, I, I 
keeping the thumbs together, the, I sometimes will go to the, put my attention on the feeling between the thumbs. Yes. But it's almost like it's the feeling of both thumbs. Yes. But then I guess I could break it down further and, and really try to just pay attention to the feeling of the right thumb or the left thumb. But it's almost like if I didn't know to put my attention on either or, I would just think the two was one feeling. Yeah. Well, and that's right. That's one of those curious things that I would really encourage you to explore because this whole thing is an exploration of your subjective experience of reality, which means an exploration of consciousness and how the mind works. That is a very interesting thing. Oh, yeah. Two thumbs, way apart from each other. Can't tell which thumb's which. I mean, that, that's sort of another thing. These are the kinds of things, though, that whenever you encounter them, you do want to explore. But the point here, in terms of this discussion, is attention has a scope, right? You can be paying attention to something this big or something this small. You can be, your attention have, can have a scope that includes both thumbs, or just the right thumb, or just the left thumb, you know, or just one tiny part of one thumb, or the scope of your attention, and, and, and this is getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but there's a practice we do where you make the entire body the scope of your attention. You expand the scope of attention and include everything. But that's something that you you do at stage six. So, you know, there's one thing about these stages is their purpose is to make put things in a sequence that allows you to progress as quickly as possible. You know, you could build a house by creating the roof first, propping the roof up on sticks, and then pouring the foundation underneath, right? But which is going to work better, go faster, be more efficient, and so forth? And so it's really, you know, the, the purpose of the stages is to systematically, step by step, bring you to where you want to be. So, uh, scope of attention and manipulating scope of attention, especially in terms of large scope of attention, is is something that we worry about more later on. Right now, you just put your attention wherever you choose to, uh, and the main thing you're concerned about, you know, the scope can get bigger or smaller, and the main thing you're concerned about initially is all of these spontaneous movements where attention either gets captured and goes somewhere else, or attention starts scanning from one thing to another, looking for something more interesting, or where, where attention is alternating back and forth so that you seem to be attending to two or three things or more at once. So. Okay, well, let's all go have lunch, and we'll come back in one hour, which is going to be about uh, 10 after lunch.